Cyclone Sundays with Ben Bruns, powered by Kelderman Manufacturing. From the Channel Seat Studios, this is IOI Everywhere. Welcome in to Cyclone Sunday, presented by Keller Manufacturing from the Channel Seed Studios. I'm Aiden White, joined as always by my man Ben Bruns. Brunzy, Iowa State picked up a win yesterday in Waco. First time since 2017, I believe, since they had won down there. Yeah. And just as we all expected, it's October 29th, and Iowa State is first place in the Big 12. <laughs> yeah, I thought I thought uh, John and Eric had a great uh, statement. You know, uh, Eric said it uh, at the end of the broadcast. You know, this this idea heading out of Athens uh, a number of weeks ago that Iowa State would be in this position uh, seemed improbable. And um, I don't think I've ever seen a team grow and advance as much as this Iowa State team. In 28 years of being around Iowa State football, I've never seen a team evolve this fast. And I can't believe how uh, unbelievably well a freshman offensive lineman um, in, in Brandon Black is playing. I, I just, it, I've never seen it. I've never seen anybody step into that role as a freshman and, you know, mid-season be not only playing good football, but playing really good football. Um, this team has, has just blown me away at how, you know, we knew they would grow. We knew that they would improve, but I, I'm just, Aiden, I can't, um, I can't say enough about how much this team has come, uh, how far they've come and they need to, because they're going to have a real test next week. You know, that Baylor team that we just played is not nearly as good as some of the Baylor teams we've seen. And, and, you know, I think Iowa state made them look pretty pedestrian in a lot of ways yesterday, um, especially with how the defense played, but um, you know, this Kansas team runs the rock really, really well from a spread formation and, uh, and, and plays multiple. And so, um, you know, how cool to be this at this point in the season and talking about, uh, what it takes to get into the championship game. So what do you think was kind of the difference between this year's team and last year's team in terms of how far they've come in one year? Well, I, I think number one, uh, what we're, what we're trying to do with, um, with how we attack, um, the, the defense is much more congruous with, uh, the players that we have, um, and the stuff that we're running, you know, um, we were, we were going nowhere from a concept perspective, uh, at times last year. And, and what I mean is, um, you know, we would motion guys into a formation that only made the numbers game worse for us. Now we motion guys out of a formation and and uh, improve the numbers situation and then attack um, and and make them deal with the backside edge. And, and I just, um, maybe the third play of the game uh, was was a, a bootleg uh, back to the back to the right um, to Jalen. Maybe it was the second play um, where you know, pound, pound front side and then bootleg backside and and hook up an easy completion for a first down. And that's the stuff that, you know, was just so lacking uh, last year that that it didn't all go together. Right. And so I think um, with what Shieldhouse is doing and and, you know, this offensive line and, and tight end room uh, improving as dramatically as they have, um, you know, this offensive line now is well coached, right? And you can see their technique uh, becoming more and more effective. And what I saw Iowa State do in the game yesterday that I hadn't seen them do in recent history is not just not just bring somebody to lead front side and then everybody block back, which had been uh, you know what what we'd gone to for a couple weeks span. But through this off week, we were able to work on the techniques it takes to reach front side which is what we were trying to do at the beginning of the year and not being successful with. Now we're reaching front side and we're getting to our landmark. We're getting to that spot that we need to be on the defensive line. And if they move around a little bit, we're, we're handling it. Um, our, our steps and our uh, footwork is so much better. Um, guys are square to the line of scrimmage longer. 
Um, you know, there was one play toward the end of the game. Uh, it was short yardage situation. We would have gotten a first down and, and uh, avoided a punt that we went up to the second level a little too fast. But man, besides that, um, I, it was just really, really, really good push at the point of attack, right? You don't see those minus yardage plays in the backfield anymore because the offensive line is two yards down the field on their blocks, um, moving guys covered up, uh, good power angles, good fits. Um, and I, the tight ends um, have come a world uh, from where they were early in the season. I mean, I saw Gabe Burkle with some great blocks uh, in this game. You know, he's a, he's a redshirt freshman. Um, and he really struggled early in the season, played a ton uh, early in the year. And, you know, uh, that's a, that's a big ask, right? As redshirt freshmen to be out on the edge blocking these guys that have, you know, all this speed and power. Um, but, you know, he is he is fitting guys up and and sticking them in into the right spot and keeping them from being able to, to get leverage on him at this point. Um you know, Steve O'Klotz has, has played really, really, really well for Iowa State. And Easton Dean, uh, you know, has just, just upped his game tremendously as well. So um, there's a lot to be proud of in that tight end room. And uh, and then, you know, you throw in the ability to, to catch it down the field um, with, you know, um, a big target like Bramer. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, that group, just like – not just like, but in an evolution similar to uh, the greatness of tight ends that we saw uh, three, four years ago uh, has really made big strides. And, you know, that allows Iowa State to play with a bunch of different guys on the field, um, not just having to spread it all out and, and go after teams like we were suggesting after week three or four in the season. Let's talk Rocco Becht. Seemed like... A lot of outside noise was saying it wasn't his day yesterday because he missed, I think, two touchdown passes that he should have had. Still is 19 to 31, 238 yards, a touchdown and a pick. Yeah, and you know, uh I think I think he would say it wasn't his best day. And I think uh I think that's fine, right? Um, you know, I I uh the throws I, I don't look, I don't think any of us that weren't there have any idea how difficult the weather conditions were, you know. Um there were a couple moments where on the TV broadcast you could tell that that um, the the rain was really coming down, but uh, I think it was far worse than any of us know. So you know, from my perspective, Rocco, uh, you know, had um, had a good day, not a great day. Um, you know that that fumbled snap I think to me was the play that uh, that of all of them was the one that I wish we had back. Um, you know that that play uh, kills a drive. That if you if you keep it going, I mean, Iowa State dominated this football game. Like, let's zoom out here for a second. Iowa State dominated this football game. We should have been up twenty four nothing at the break, right? Um, but we missed a few plays here and there, and settled for a couple field goals. And you know, I just think um, that that's the position we're in right, where we don't play our best football uh, and we still win comfortably. Um, Got to make some plays on defense, right, to get them shut out. Got to make that fourth down stop. Um, and the offense has to, has to you know, uh, pick up first down if, if you do that. Um, we throw it three times inside the five-yard line, um, you know, with eight minutes or so on the clock. Um, you know, if, if you if you uh, go back and if you could do that over again, maybe you'd do something just a little different. But look, um, this Iowa State football team dominated at Baylor, um, and and you know, just so happens the score was a little closer than um, than it could have been. Um, so so that's okay, right? Like. Uh, right. A win's a win, and uh, Iowa State's tied for first place in the league. Speaking of domination, Iowa State's defensive line yesterday, I think, played their best game to date. What do you think? I totally agree, and, you know, um, I, I was really shocked. I mean, um, I, I just remember how proficient uh, Baylor's QB was two years ago, right, as a freshman, and, um, you know, I'm just like, where's that guy, you know, because – 
it seemed like he had one target yesterday. And, uh, you know, we, we picked one of those. Um, so I, I, he just was uncomfortable all day. And, you know, the three man rush was getting there, but then there was always a spy too, right? There was always a fourth guy that was sitting on him. And as soon as he tried to, to run, that to me is the single biggest evolution that Iowa State has had. Uh, there's two things this defense has done this year that just, you know, is, is so emblematic of a really well coached team. First one is we really struggled containing the quarterback on uh, broken late run plays. Um, and you could go back in history a ways and say, you know, Iowa State dominates defensively, but there's this one thing where, you know, quarterback scramble causes us to, to um, you know, give up unnecessary first downs, right? Doesn't mean that um, the team ultimately, <clears throat> excuse me, ends up scoring, but it means that they're, they're um, still being productive. Um, John Heacock this year with this crew has figured out how to make sure that there's always somebody, you know, in a position to shut that quarterback run off. And when that guy scrambles, now, first couple games, first three games of the year was like, yikes, who's got that? Um, but now it's always getting erased. And um, and we're tackling well when that quarterback scrambles, right? So he may get back to the line of scrimmage, but he's not going to go get eight yards. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's number one. Number two is how bad Iowa State had been at tackling in the alley early this season. You know, we were un, unusually bad at that uh, to begin the year. And I'll tell you what, I mean, you saw it. Other than a freshman, you know, who to me looked like the next Jordy Nelson, um, that kid has unbelievable balance and a, and a and surprising speed and power. And so, you know, he's going to be a good player. But uh, we were also weren't ready for him taking the angles that he took against uh, against our look. And as the game went on, we sort of dialed in a little bit more against that. But um, that alley run is just gone again, right? And Iowa State had been so good at defending uh, against you know any sort of off tackle look um, <clears throat> with with the linebackers and secondary uh, for for Hecox tenure that um, it was it was shocking earlier this year that we were bad at it. Right um, now we're good at it again, and and it, you can't get a better time to do that than uh, when you're about to play these Jayhawks who are really proficient at uh, you know off tackle run uh, out of you know maybe a one tight look, um, and and the ability to to stretch you and then vertically uh, hit after breaking a tackle um, that they have uh, really good speed and power uh, in the backfield. So I think we need to talk about the targeting. Yeah. TJ Tampa, yeah. I think yeah. there's 55 seconds left in the first half. We talked before. If there's a time to get a targeting, that's the time. Yeah, right. right. Missing basically just one half of football. Yep. Do you think it was targeting? Well, you give me your read first. How about that? In real time, I thought it was targeting. I'm like, okay. yep, he's done. That, you know, defenseless receiver. Look like you hit him in the head neck area, but you go to a replay and it looked like it was kind of shoulder to almost shoulder. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, the replay angle that I think showed it the best, or at least the one that I liked the best, maybe that was the problem. There was one that I liked better than others shows, shows his shoulder contacting here. Right. And, you know, I've seen so many, what I thought were absolutely blatant targeting calls, helmet to helmet, right? Uh, and and it's like the definition. The guy launches, and and it's helmet to helmet, and it gets taken. You know, it, it's like they said he was making a football move. I'm like, well, holy cow, what? Like, I don't know. He was just catching the ball and coming down. No different than this play that um, that that happened with Tampa. Um, I, I didn't like the call. Um, I love I love the you know the reason that that receiver had the injury that he had is not because of the blow to the head and neck. It's because of how hard he hit his head on the on the field when he landed. Banfield turf. Yep. Well, just whatever. Like it's just it's just he just boom 
right? And, and you know, the ass, yes, that started because of the stick up high, right? But the real trauma to the head came from how his head slapped on the, on the field, not from the hit from Tampa. So, you know, to me, I think the officials didn't get the holistic picture of how the actual injury occurred. And, you know, um, we're fortunate that, um, A, we won the game, B, that, you know, TJ uh, is going to be, um, you know, he got a, he got a half to rest up and, um, you know, he's going to have to have a huge game against KU. Um, but I didn't particularly like the call. Let's wrap up a little bit with uh, some Kansas talk. So can we talk they... about can we talk about the the broadcast for a minute from ESPN Plus? Oh, Holy cow! Brutal! Holy cow! <laughs> was that the worst broadcasting team you've you've heard? It was for me. Uh, West Virginia in twenty twenty one in Morgantown. Okay. Yeah, takes okay. a cake for me. Okay. Always will. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, that was bad. That was bad. It's like. Which which one of these coaches, you know, is this guy's brother? Right. <laughs> you know, it's just like, like that is terrible. But hey, um, yeah, I hope I never hear those two guys ever call a game again. But um, anyway, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you think this game changes who we see? Or excuse me, you know, Jalen Daniels has been out for I think five games now in right. a row. Right. Do you think the defensive scheme changes whether we see Jason Bean or Jalen Daniels next week? I would guess there's a little bit of a tweak to it. I mean, I, my get, I, I would also say that the staff would probably tell you there's no change, uh, and they'll probably tell the kids there's no change. Um, but you know, um, I think uh, regardless, you got to be able to set up to stop the running back first. In my opinion, right? You, you got to focus on that, and then you know, uh, contain the quarterback the way we have been. And, um, you know, if, if they, uh, if Jalen Daniels plays and they're running a bunch of quarterback lead plays where all of a sudden the running back now is blocking instead of, you know, instead of, um, um, carrying the ball or, or, you know, an option, uh, read option look of some kind, then that's a different, that's a different type of play you have to defend. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I just know that um, I just know that we'll have a great game plan and and we'll come out and execute well. These linebackers have taken a huge step forward, much like we talked about with the tight ends, right? The linebackers have have uh, really grown up in this um, last four weeks, and and uh, this will be their biggest test of the year, I think. I think I would say to wear the black uniforms. You know, uh, yeah, six p.m. Um, you have to. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. That why was not? when you used to talk about. I think they had orange pants. They were the big game britches. Yeah, yeah. Blacks are the big game britches now. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I, I I think that makes sense. I do. Uh, it's funny. I hadn't thought about uniform choice. Um, I wouldn't be afraid to wear those. Uh, to wear those Jack Trice unis again. Those things are sick, like super sick. Um, if we're talking about things that we would love to have, uh, I'd love to have a black version of that because there you go. that'd be super awesome. Yeah. But uh, do you like the alternate black in general? I really do. I really do. I, I, you know, um, I think any, I think anybody that, um, you know, I, yeah, there, there's people that have lots of different views on it. My view is, the kids like it. Um, does it, does it give them an edge? Right. Um, and, and, you know, does it, um, is it fun? Right. Um, cause that's what this is supposed to be, right. This whole thing, no matter whether it's good or it's bad, it's supposed to be fun. Right. And, uh, I think that's the piece that I hope everybody continues to recognize as the season uh, progresses. This is supposed to be fun. And, uh, you know, um, I'm excited to see what happens. Yeah, it should be electric Saturday night next week in Jack Trice Stadium. Ben, sure. this is all we have time for. Thank you, as always, for your analysis. We now send it to our channel, Seedsman of the Week, Matt Nelson. Okay, we now welcome into Channel Seed Studios, our Channel Seedsman of the Week, Matt Nelson. This is Cyclone Sunday, presented by Killer Manufacturing. Matt, Iowa State picks up 
a big time road win, not in terms of who they beat, but sitting pretty at the top of the Big 12 right now. Who would have thought, right? Um, hey, this is what we all thought. I would say it would be four and one going into November. That's good. That's correct. With two Big 12 road wins. Um, man, those are hard to come by in this league. So, uh, what, a, what a win. I know they maybe didn't play their best, but I, I think with a road win, you don't care about the score, you care about the outcome. Absolutely right. So what do you like out of the Cyclones today? Um, they just continued uh, continued to play just gutty football, right? So complimentary in terms of like the, the special teams were good, right? Contreras continues to play well. But they what I was really looking for, Aiden, was uh, I wrote this um, kind of in the uh, – we talked about this on podcast. It's in the recap I just wrote uh, about the game. They had played turnover-free football in their Big Ten, Big 12 rings up to today. After that fumble, right, I'm like, oh, boy. The, the recipe's been pretty simple. Don't don't turn the ball over right. and your special teams are yep. good enough. You can get through these with a win. Same thing with that pick before half. I think everybody was nervous about it. They they fought through that. First time they've turned the ball over in a Big 12 game and won. Um, that's big for them, especially on the road, right? I know the, the crowd was great. and Baylor's maybe not terrific this year, but that's a big step for a young team because they played really – error-free football winning those three games previously. And this, this, they did not play that way today. I mean, that Cincinnati game was almost perfect. So really happy with how they, they, they gutted it out despite playing, I don't know, in uh, B minus football. Right. So yeah, talking about that Cincinnati game, I think there were con- some concerns, you know, was this a good time for the buy for Iowa state? I don't know right. about you, but it didn't look like they really missed a step, you know? No, and, and the offensive line continued to play great. I mean, they almost had a 100-yard rusher today, um, ran for over 150 yards, and got first downs when they needed to. Rocco was not under pressure. That's what, what I was most inter- interested to see. You, 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 you know, you're playing well, but you also get time for the offensive line to continue to improve. And they, turns out we can run the ball. So, um, in reality, I think the bye week probably did just did them just fine. What I was really impressed with overall was coming out and scoring on the first drive out of a bye week. I feel like in my lifetime, Iowa State has been terrible out of buys. So that was really nice to see them come out right away and move the football. Let's look ahead to next week. You know, again, just as we expected, Iowa State and Kansas would have Big 12 championship. You know, this is, this could decide it. Very big implications next week in Ames. How do you feel? Um, I feel great. I mean, be a fun game. Kansas's defense is not good, has not been recently, but they, they can force some turnovers at times. Um, Iowa State is the type of team that should be able to win against them, right? Oklahoma and, and Kansas are kind of Spider-Man meme gif, right? Like very similar teams, explosive, poor defenses. Um, so I think I think Iowa State should prevent, you know, pose a different challenge. And they they really like to run the ball. They look at look at Jason Bean's stats from today, right? It was like he completed 14 passes for 150 yards or something like that. It's running the ball as their bread butter. So can Iowa State's run defense stop them? That's what I'll be looking for. That's in my opinion, that's the key matchup, right? They're, they they play with a linebacker like a fourth down lineman. Um, they tackled well at times today. Kind of didn't late in that game, but mm-hmm. that's what it's going to come down to on Saturday. Can they stop the run against Kansas? And if they do, I think they're going to win the game. I think you're right. Any last parting thoughts before we get out of here? feels great to be five and three, man, after the way that the season started. Um, it's fun. Enjoy it. I know I've learned over the, you know, after last year, you, you celebrate and, and uh, enjoy these wins that you earned. So that's my plan for this evening. Sounds like a great plan. All right, Matt, thank you for your time. As always, this has been Cyclone Sunday presented by Color Manufacturing from the Channel Seed Studios. We'll see you next time.